talk about and they're like I don't know get up there and tell stories yeah there you go so watching you guys do all this stuff for the last hour it hurts <laughs> uh, I'm an accountant by training I drive a desk for a living and uh, was the guy who was up here was talking about you know when you get to your 40s and I'm closer to 55 than I am 54 <laughs> and so when he said 40 I was like man what, how long ago was that I, I can't remember what I was doing when I was 40. That's how long ago I was. Is there anyone here over 40? Oh, all right. Okay. My camera crew says they're going to get me an AR, AARP uh, membership this November when I, when I turned 55. But uh, watching some, I, I wish I would have seen some of the things that uh, were were talked about in this is watching some of that i'm i'm a unique uh specimen i guess uh i spend 100 days a year doing hunting out in the woods sleeping in tents eating crappy food uh not getting enough sleep trying to smile trying to make people think that i'm having a great day every day <laughs> uh, and i am i mean i think about it it's like well i could be back at the cpa firm with those miserable people <laughs> and so i i'm lucky that i get to do that um could probably have hillary being she's a doctor tell you about the other part of my situation is i don't have a portal vein uh, portal vein is one of the critical pieces to get blood to your liver so I've been on a low protein diet since 2005. I've lost about 30 pounds of muscle mass. I can't get rid of lactic acids and a lot of other things like all of you can. Uh, I get about 20 to, 25 to 30% of the blood flow to my liver that all of you get. And if you understand the role the liver plays, uh, it, and we used to be able to edit that out of content. When, when we were just doing TV, we would just say, oh, we'll act like that day didn't happen. Well, now we do this day-by-day -day stuff on YouTube. And when Randy disappears for a day or two because he's got a liver problem, we got to tell the audience what happened. So uh, it's just part of what I, I have to deal with. And when he was talking about the, the mental toughness part of it, um, I think and I'll use my camera guys as a little bit of validation to what I think. Uh, I think I can outwalk just about anybody. I'm not going to outlift them. I'm not going to outclimb them, but I can outwalk them. Uh, and mentally, the things that used to bother me when I was 30, I don't care if it's cold, if it's windy, if I'm miserable, if I got a hot spot on my foot, whatever. I can walk all day long from daylight to dark if I want. And that whole part about mental toughness is the only thing that allows me to get through a 100-day season. Uh, my shoulders are shot. I, I can barely, I, I've got my bow dialed down to 60 pounds. I can't do a push up. I just can't because of the pain. So I, I'm a little bit of like, ever hear that Johnny Cash song, One Piece at a Time, where I worked at the yeah. auto factory? And it, that's kind of how I am. I've got very few working parts, and, uh, and the doctors keep telling me I'm going to be in for some replacement parts sooner rather than later, but uh, nothing against the doctors of the world, but I, I'm not real big on surgeries and, and other stuff. So I feel really lucky that I get to do what I do. Um, I moved to Bozeman 30 years ago. You, if you listen to my podcast, you know I give marital advice. Um, and there's no charge for that. And there's no responsibility if it doesn't work out either. But my wife and I came here for our honeymoon 30 years ago, 1989. And she really liked to fish. And I was thinking, how do I like, get her to go to Montana? Because I love to hunt. I like to fish too, but... And so we came here, and on our way out of town, she turned to me and said, I'm moving here. Are you coming with? Wow, I just got married and I already got the ultimatum. And uh, <laughs> so we, we moved here. Uh, it took ridiculous pay cuts to move here, but 
my theory was it was easier to take a pay cut when you're 26 or 27 than it is 36 or 37 or 46 or 47. And so we've been here ever since. And I can't believe that I get to do what I do. Wake up every day, figure out, all right, how am I gonna promote self-guided public land hunting and create advocates for that cause? That's the why of our business plan for what we do. It's, this is an accountant problem. When, you, when accountants build business plans, they're like this thick. It's like four reams of paper. And since I built that plan in 2007, there's not a page in it that is relevant any longer. Everything changes in distribution platforms and how the sponsorship world works. The only page that's still relevant is the first page that says the why. And the why of what I do, why I get up every day, is to promote self-guided public land hunting and create advocates for the cause. And creating advocates for the cause pisses off a lot of people. Um, I've not been blessed with a very good filter. Uh, or maybe I've been blessed without a filter. I don't know how you'd look at that. Uh, my wife knows I grew up in a little logging town in northern Minnesota where cussing is an art form. And she always worries that when I get too worked up, I'll revert back to my family's manner of communications uh, and so I I think about just the, the benefit of having a, a career a CPA life that let me hunt and my wife has always said you wouldn't become a CPA if tax season was in the fall would you well no <laughs> that's pretty obvious I mean what, what kind of <laughs> that's not a real astute observation, honey. I was just like, the real, that's how it would be. I would never take a job where I couldn't hunt and fall. Um, so part of that was by plan and by design of, of what I wanted to do. And one of the things that I think I've been blessed with is I don't quit. Uh, if you saw some of the hurdles we had trying to start these platforms, if you are a history of what happened in the late 2000s, we started this in August of 2008 or September of 2008. I signed a contract with a production company for $300,000 to produce the whole season. I signed a $180,000 contract with Outdoor Channel. And I had eyes on the road and I had this group working with me and we're getting all these verbal commitments from sponsors. And then the stock market crashed in October of 2008. So I had $480,000 of obligation and I, all the sponsors left except $25,000 of it. So when you go home and tell your wife, you know that business plan I built? Doesn't look like it's gonna quite work out that way. Um, but I, I'm blessed to be able to just do it and have a wife that supports it uh, and live in a place where it's, it's what we live, what we do, where we're at. And there's plenty of times it would have been really easy to quit, whether it's from the finances or from just the challenges of dealing with TV networks or someone wanting you to do something that you don't want to do. The beauty of how I do it, and this was by design, my wife and I said, we will never make these platforms something that we depend upon for our livelihood. Because as quick as it is part of what you built your lifestyle or your livelihood on, someone's got some leverage on you. So if my largest sponsor came and said, I want you to do this or else, if it wasn't something I wanted to do, it'd be or else. So. It's, it's all those things that make it such a blessing to be here and get to do it. And if you wonder why it is that I can smile every day, that, that's why. I, I said, when I, my whole liver event happened in 2005, uh, I go to the Mayo Clinic every year and they said, you know what, you're not gonna be a CPA for much longer. You're gonna have to really scale back because of the stress and because of the, all the things that go along with that. So, well, I'm gonna do. I guess I'm gonna hunt some more. <laughs> My wife said, "More." <laughs> but so that's how I got into what I do. I have a passion for any kind of hunting. 
Um, I could sit here and tell stories all day long. That's why I love podcasts. Or we try to have our podcast be as though you're just sitting around the campfire with us. And I I don't take myself very seriously at all. I mean, I, my number one uh, supplement is provided by Dairy Queen. So I tell you how serious I take myself. Um, I'm below average at everything, uh, other than quitting. That, that's probably the one thing I think I, I'm above average at. Is I, just, I refuse to quit. So it's, I don't know. I, that, that's kind of how the path that got to where Randy Newberg has the chance to sit up in front of crowds of people and tell stories and lies and BS. Uh, hey, Randy, I got a question for you. Yeah. If you had to. Pin it down. What would you say your mental toughness is developed from, and how could you give advice on how to create it? Because we spent a lot of time this weekend talking about mental toughness, mm -hmm. um, but not so much on how to create it. Yeah. I created my mental toughness by accident. It, it wasn't intention. Uh, there's a mental toughness about your getting through a daily event and then I think there's a mental toughness about not giving up you know, what your dream or what your idea or what your career is. Um, uh, when I was 18, I got an appointment to West Point and I didn't want to go. I, I wanted to go to Air Force Academy, but they wouldn't take me for my eyes. And so they said, you should send all your stuff to Annapolis or West Point. I'm like, well, I don't want to go there. So I come home, tell my parents, my stepdad, my dad, my mom, they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> Send them your stuff. You're going to West Point or Annapolis. I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't want to do that. And anyhow, I did that. And when you're 18, you want to please your parents. And I got an appointment. I went to West Point for my plea summer. <coughs> had an absolute blast. And then I left. I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. I was doing what my parents wanted me to do. And uh, so I quit one thing in my life. It's I, I, you think I could get past that at this point? You know, it's 40, or whatever, 35, 37 years ago. It still sticks with me. It just pisses me off that I quit something. And so that's what developed my, I'm never going to quit. As far as the, the mental toughness of, you know, it's, hey, we, like in Alaska last year, we did a doll sheep hunt, 13 mile pack out with heavy loads, it's spitting snow, scree slopes and everything. And I, I don't know, I just, I find places to take my mind that says, you know, it could be worse. Or, you know, when you get back to the truck, you're, you're gonna think this was fun. And if you quit, you're gonna have that feeling that you carry, what, that I've carried with me since I quit West Point. And, I hate that. I don't want to ever do anything that that causes me to feel like I failed. Um, so that's why I say, for me, it was kind of by accident. It wasn't by design where I said, I'm going to push myself to go do something and then do a 180 on it. But physically, I think as you get older, you just realize you, there, there's also the mental mindset of we've all lost family or friends or younger people way before their time. And in my, my mind, I can think of so many people who would give their you know what to be able to go on that sheep pump. But maybe their health doesn't allow, or maybe they're not here with us. And I'm gonna snivel about it because I'm having a high toxin load that day. Shut up, Randy, just keep going. Um, so for me, it's always about perspectives. Just, it, it could always be a whole lot worse. And when I say it, some guy from England lit me up because I said, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I was born in the greatest country, da, 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 da. So, oh, well, the U.S. isn't that great. Well, whatever. I think it is. Um, and that's not a political statement. It's just, I was born in an unbelievable situation. Yeah, I was born in a poor little logging town where all of us were on the wrong side of the tracks. But you know what? I, I, if you would ask me, could I have it any different or any other way? No, I wouldn't. And... I think about that. I, I think about what if I would have been born in Seoul, South Korea? I'd never have seen the places I've seen or experienced what I've seen. What if I was somebody who 
did not have parents who thought that childcare was sending the kids down to the river to fish for smallmouth bass and then come home for dinner. I was really lucky that my parents were borderline neglective. <laughs> really, I, I was, I, I think, anyhow. I mean, the downside is today if you did what my parents did with me, you'd, they'd come and take your kids away from you. Uh, but I, so for me, it's always about the perspective of, okay, I'm uncomfortable. All right, I have a pain, I have this. Well, I can think about my uncle Elton, who was more like my younger or my older brother than my uncle. He died at age 62 of brain cancer. He'd have given anything to be here doing what I'm doing today. So suck it up, Buttercup. You know, smile and go do it. I, I don't know. I, it, it, that's not a science in any way. It's just my mental way of processing things. So, not to turn this into a recession. Yes. When you talked about that, I, uh, I was wondering how do you balance between not or not giving or not quitting, not giving up, with knowing you're doing the right things. One of the things you've done really well is always taking that next step and change gears. You, you transitioned really well from this isn't working to doing this. And I think a lot of people struggle with this could be as simple as hunting. You know, I'm looking for a deer, I'm like, man, should I quit and go somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Is that quitting? Or could be in the work life, like, am I in the right career path? Is this a good move? And so one thing that I think you do really well is stay current with the times you're always testing, you're always moving things, moving the needle, and checking how do you balance, like, am I doing the right thing real quick? Yeah. Well, for me, it's easy because I have a why. My why is written everywhere. My staff is like, if I got to see that why one more time, I'm gonna tear. I'm gonna go take that off the whiteboard at work. <laughs> so I can change gears or try a different approach. If it's all under the umbrella of that why, I'm not quitting. And so that, whether it's like when I left traditional TV, cable TV, everyone's like, man, you're making a huge mistake. Uh, mostly it was the network telling me I was making a ma major mistake, but my gut told me I wasn't. And I've never been afraid of failing on one thing, I guess that's helpful. And whether it's out in the woods, fishing or whatever, I'll try anything. Have you ever seen those Be The Decoy hats? I was like the first guy I ever used those. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get, if this doesn't work, I'm gonna get ridiculed to the point where I'm gonna lose all my sponsors. <laughs> but. My wife tried to build me a hat like that about five years before that on a baseball cap. I cut the, the skull cap off this little buck, but it kept falling down like this and it didn't work. So when I saw it, I'm, I'm going to get one of those. And I knew people would laugh about it, but I didn't really care if it worked. So that's just an example of, of how I approach it. I, I don't, I think if you're sitting still doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to get the same results. Uh, What's the old saying? If you always do what you always done, you'll always get what you always got. Well, if you don't like what you always got, do something different. I, I mean, fishing last week. My, my wife's a fanatic wildlife angler. We go wildlife fishing and I'm not sitting in the same spot for more than 10 minutes. If those fish don't want to bite their carp, I'm moving on to the next ones. I just, same with with how my approach is to elk hunting. We've done a bunch of e-scouting series on our YouTube channel, and I want to have multiple plans. And I stick with that plan because I'm confident if I stick with that plan, it may not work on day one, or the afternoon of day one, or the morning of day two, or blah, blah, blah. It may be the morning of day four before it works. But I know I've done my research, I know I've thought it out, and I have a plan that I'm willing to go and follow and that plan requires some changes of location, some changes of strategies, but it's all part of a bigger plan. It's not randomness. So it's just the way I approach everything. There's, again, a lot of science to that. <laughs> you got to be careful when you ask me a question. You, you, don't, you don't, I don't even know what, how it's going to get answered. <laughs> but I don't know if anyone has any specific question, but you're all younger than me, all more fit than me, uh, all better shots than me. So you probably aren't going to gain a lot from, from talking to me. But, uh, uh, conservation, how, how can we uh, Sure. Can yeah, that's 
Uh, that's a big part of our platforms uh, is conservation. Um, it, there, there's a multitude of ways. Some people want to be part of a group. Some want to just kind of do their own thing. Um, and conservation can be done hands-on in the ground. Go volunteer for a project. It can be, okay, I'm going to help with the fundraiser. It could be, I'm going to engage with my county commission or my state legislator or my whoever. Um, there's... You can either, I, I say you either buy your advocacy or you earn your advocacy. And some people just are so busy, they're just going to say, here, I'm going to write a big check, give it to this group, you guys go take care of it. I like the hands-on part of it. I mean, we're releasing a film at the Total Archery Challenge. Uh, what's that Saturday, the 19th of July, something like that, up in Big Sky. <clears throat> and it's called Selfless, and we spent over a year with the Fraternity of the Desert Bighorn in Southern Nevada, going out with them while they're building these water guzzlers. And this is just an example, but the point of it is these people, most of them have never drawn a sheep tank. And we as hunters get criticized that, oh, you only do conservation if it benefits you. Well, these people have no idea if they're ever going to draw a sheep tank. But they're out there doing it. They're having a great time. Some of them are like the one guy who we feature in the film. He owns a concrete company. So he's really handy to have when you're building big concrete basins for <laughs> collecting water and all this. Um, but there's other people who are like me, you know, bean counters who don't know a shovel from a hammer. Uh, but they're out there doing something. And then there's some of them who... They really don't have time to go out on the projects, but they go help raise money and they'll coordinate this. So the point is everybody has some role they can play. And I think people who are the most effective in their advocacy for conservation are those who find that role that fits who they are as a person. Don't try to be this person or that person or don't feel that you gotta be with this group or that group. Find that works for you and that's something you're passionate about. Because conservation, it's never easy. It's always uncomfortable. I find that out every time I advocate something and my brother calls me up to tell me what an idiot I am. Uh, and it's always inconvenient. We're, we're all busy. There's always times where you know, we could be doing something else. Um, and you guys went down to the Sphinx on your hike. Is that all right? So just over the mountain from the Sphinx. Most people don't know this, but when I moved here in 93, that was all checkerboard from Bozeman all the way to Yellowstone Park. The, the railroad had come through back in the late 1800s and they got every other section of land for building the railroads. Well, later on, 50, 70 years later, they spun those off into timber companies or land companies and Plum Creek is who owned, they were a division of uh, Burlington Great Northern or Burlington Northern. They had a sawmill right over here about three miles. Uh, it's not here anymore. Anyhow, group from Oregon, big forms a company called Big Sky Lumber, Mel McDougall and Tim Blixit, and they come and buy all those checkerboard pieces. And we used to be able to come from the Gallatin Canyon side up over the Yellow Mules or any of those and drop into Bear Creek where you guys would have started on that hike. Well, these people closed all that. And they warned us. They said, we bought it. We're going to close all this next year. You can hunt this year. And everyone's like, yeah, right, sure. Hundreds of thousands of acres off limits to hunting. And a bunch of us formed a little rod and gun club here in Bozeman and worked our butts off and worked with anyone we could, the Elk Foundation and others. And all that got consolidated. But we had to give up some things. We had to give up the Big Sky area, the Yellowstone Club where... The billionaires live and then moonlight basin or just the millionaires live um, we had to give those up but in the process we consolidated 70 some thousand acres of land and made it now solid public land and i say that to as an example of conservation because when we started that there were not any of us that knew anything about the political system but it took engaging in that political system, and we were all really passionate about that. For me, I, I'm a, look, I moved there and took like a 60% pay cut for public access. <laughs> and now it's gone. <laughs> I'm going to get my ass out there and start doing something about this. Um, so 
uh, yeah. It just, for me, I just fell into something that I'm comfortable with. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking, and so a lot of times I get asked to be the big loudmouth who goes up and talks about it. But there's other people who are probably more effective and do more work in conservation than I do, even though they're not the voice of it. So. I mean, do you call it the BLM office? Do you, I mean, where do you start? One of the things that's really helpful is if you are a member of a lot of the groups that you can get on their email list and they'll send you alerts of things that are happening in your backyard. Like or something like that. Yeah, Elk Foundation. I mean, your state associations are really good at that. Um, they usually have someone in your state legislature that is paying attention. Uh, Pheasants Forever has a good group on it. Um, you know, it depends on where you're located out here in the West. Most of uh, our information is coming from Elk Foundation or BHA or Trout Unlimited. If you move, the more you move the other directions to the east, the groups will be state-based groups, Quality Deer Management Association, U.S. Sportsman Alliance, some of those. But if you get on their email list, it'll let you know when bad stuff's coming your way. And that's, that's kind of the place to start. So. You guys are wore out. I can see it. <laughs> I can tell more story. I mean, I just don't think my stories are very compelling. That's why I'm hesitant. Any questions okay? Sure, I'm open to all questions. I, I, don't, I don't want to pay your comfort level. Um, my first race in Elk County was in Montana. Um, and in yeah, November uh, here in Montana. And, and so I was just thinking, if you buy Montana in quarters, which uh, quarter do you think I should focus on these coming on? On your general tag? Yeah, general tag. I was thinking Southeast. But uh, I, I know it's a little private, but, yeah. but there's a lot of help. They do their surveys, and it'll tell you if it's below at, below objective, at objective, or over objective. In the area I told you, most of those units are at or above objective. Oh, yeah, it's Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks puts it out there. If you go to their website, I think there's a hunt planner out there. Uh, I see you're a member of Go Hunt, obviously. Go Hunt has that that uh, map out under the Montana strategy articles. Um, so I would start looking there. Uh, are you coming in November again? Yeah, yeah, I'm here in November. Uh, okay, so the, I'm gonna, that kind of gets to how I approach things. Um, I spent my first six years not killing an elk and I hunted it pretty much every day of season. My wife probably thought I was having an affair or something. Come back looking all haggard. Uh, <laughs> if you're recording that, now I'm really in trouble. But I, had never, I never brought any alcohol. She had to be wondering, what's going on here? Uh, and this gets back to fishing, and some of you who've heard this story, uh, I, I apologize for the du duplication, but growing up in northern Minnesota, I knew everything about walleyes because that's what you do there. You fish walleyes spring, summer, fall, winter. You, you learn what walleyes do, where they go, how they go. And so I got to thinking, why is it that I can go to just about any lake, any time of year, and I can catch walleyes, but I can't find an elk? Because Montana at the time said we had 100,000 elk. I thought that was the biggest lie in the world. I'd go a whole season and see two or three cows. But there are no elk here. So one summer, I sat down and I'm like, all right, how do I approach walleye fishing? Well, I know that they have these kind of periods of their life where they're in certain places meeting certain needs. Okay, pre-spawn, I know they're going to be in the first place the water's starting to warm up because they want to get to the warmest water right away for the spawn. So they go from this pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn, post -spawn, full summer, late summer, winter pattern. I'm like, well, what could I do that's kind of an elk equivalent to that? And so that's what I did. And I came up with early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, late season. And okay, so that's kind of where they're transitioning from certain behaviors or certain needs. That sounds pretty, pretty reasonable, pretty uh, similar to how I approach the walleye world. Well, what are their basic needs? 
Well, walleyes, they need food, uh, you know, forage, um, you know, whatever they're going to eat. They need, they have a spawning need, they have da da da. Well, what are the needs elk have? Well, they have food, they have water. Because they get hunted a lot, they need sanctuary or survival. And then seasonally, they'll have a breeding need. All four of those needs rotate in any of those calendar, five calendar periods I mentioned. So if you go and see elk in August when they're in the early season and they're on a food pattern, they're gonna be in a completely different location than in November when you're coming out in rifle season and sanctuary is their number one need. So you're not gonna go look for an elk in November in the same place as you'd go look for them in August because they're trying to satisfy a different need. And if they're trying to satisfy a different need, they're gonna be in a different location. So that's what I got in my head. I'm like, all right. Late October, rifle season opens in Montana. All right, they're gonna be looking for sanctuary. Hunting pressure is gonna start first day. All right, they're probably gonna to go to here. I go there, I sit on a rock and opening morning, fill my first elk tag. <laughs> I think of this six years ago. Uh, and uh, that's what drives everything that you see us do in Monroe Elk County, has those five calendar periods. Uh, when we're e-scouting, when we're planning, whatever. All right, what calendar period is it? What's the primary need? And where are they gonna to go to satisfy that primary need? Because they're not, I thought they were randomly just distributed across the landscape. Because I didn't know anything about elk. And if you listen to my podcast, I'm a big fan of Jack Ward Thomas's book, Elk and Elk Ecology. I bought that book that summer and I read everything I could about what elk need, what their preferred food sources are. I mean, everything that an accountant could absorb about elk. Now I was starting to learn as much about elk as my lifetime experience had taught me about walleyes. So now it became easier to understand where they were gonna be at certain times of the year. So that's, I don't know if that helps. Okay. What's that? Elk and Elk Ecology by Jack Ward Thomas. Don't get it on Amazon because it's out of print in Amazon. And it's $600 on Amazon. The Wildlife Management Institute in Virginia just made a new run of them and it's like 40 bucks. So, yeah, once I started promoting, people are like, I can't afford that. What do you mean $600? Go on Amazon, oh man, it's six hundred dollars. So, uh, but it's a if you're into elk hunting, it's a super super good resource. And uh, there's a lot of people who've done research in that book that is cited who are still around, and uh, most of them are retired now. But you can go Google other parts of their research. Uh, the Starkey Experimental Forest in Oregon. Absolutely. You go and Google those Starkey reports and studies, you're going to learn so much about elk preferences of food, so much about elk preferences of bedding. Now, as for me, because well, I, I do a lot of rifle hunting. Uh, I love archery hunting, but usually I still have my tag after archery season's over. So <laughs> I'm not like some of you guys where your tag's already filled when rifle season comes around. You know, if you go read some of these studies and you find out that elk bed in the top third of, of the rift. So when I'm glassing, I'm really, I, I will occasionally cover this lower two thirds, but I'm way more effective if I cover this top third. And then you also will find out that they don't like to bed in anything of a slope that's more than 20 degrees. Okay, let's just eliminate all the super crazy steep stuff and focus on these little pockets where it's in the top third and the slope is less than 20 degrees. Now all of a sudden I'm way more effective with my time and my glassing. And I can cover a lot more terrain. And if I don't see some, I'm going to the next glassing knob. If I don't see anything, I'm going to the next glassing knob. So I... I say, how, how did I hunt before Al Gore invented the internet? No, that's, that's strictly a joke. Um, people get worked up about that. Okay. Yeah, I, if you can't laugh at Al Gore claiming he invented the internet, you need to adjust your sense of humor. But I spend a ton of time, even today, 
Googling and researching articles. Your BLM range cons, they call them, the, the range management people, are unbelievable resources. Your state agency people who are doing research on forage competition between, say, maybe domestic livestock and elk, those reports are gold. If you go and read the reports that have been done in New Mexico, and you would look at New Mexico after the, the monsoon season, and you'd swear it was all the same grasses out there. There are so many different grasses out there. And in late August, the elk are preferring one of them compared to what they're preferring in late September. And you will read that stuff and it's like, why didn't I know this? Uh, and then you go out there and you're, well, the other great thing about Al Gore's internet is Google has images. So when I read in these scientific reports of, you know, this, they, they use these Latin terms. I'm from Finland and my family came from Finland and Sweden. We didn't speak Latin. So I got to go and type it into Google and see an image of it. And then I save it on my phone. So I'm, I'll be out there. People think I'm surfing the internet. Really what I'm doing is I'm looking at the grasses like, oh, that's what that is. Um, and it, I always thought it looked the same and I always struggled. Well, all right, there's four similar looking pieces of landscape here. Why are the elk always in that one in October? The other three look identical. Well, you go up there and you start inspecting. There is something that they are selecting for in that one that brings them there. And maybe three weeks later, they're over in this one and they're just hammering that one. Why? Because there's something in whether it's how the, the maturity of the plants, the, the, the dryness, uh, uh, how the plants are, are kind of closing down for winter. There's something that those elk are keyed in on. And a lot of that information is out there. And it's completely different for Montana than it is for New Mexico. It's completely different for the Alpine in Colorado than it is for Nevada. And so once you know where your tag is, you got to do a lot of research. At least I do. Uh, for me, when we go out, we got five days. We hope that we can figure it out, sort it out, and pack it out. And we'll, we'll get there. And we, we got to have a plan in place. We, we can't rely on just random luck or we, we'd have, well, we already have a lot of hunts where we don't fill a tag, right? You know, we'd have even more of those hunts where we don't fill a tag if it was just all about random luck. So even though in our footage or in our episode that may look like we're just randomly moving across the landscape, there's a serious plan that's been developed. We're doing those right now, all summer. Or, I mean, Michael has Wyoming, I've got New Mexico, and then we're going to do Montana, and then yeah. we are, we're planning all this. What we're going to do the opening morning, what we're going to do the open, uh, opening evening, all that stuff. And it's based on the research we're finding by Google, by other books, reports, and it's driven by which of the calendar periods are we hunting. Right. I, I got to make it that simple because I'm not smart enough to do it any other way. I mean, that's why I got into accounting. If the debits don't equal the credits, you get an F. <laughs> if the debits equal the credits, you get an A. That's how simple it's got to be for me. So that's how I came up with this five calendar periods of outcome. And it might be completely wrong, but it, it sometimes works for me. I'm sure if you had some other elk hunters in here who would do seminars, they'd be like, don't, don't believe in any sense. Uh, sure. Can you go through the primary needs of all those five? <laughs> okay. First, let's talk about what those calendar periods are on our human calendar. Early season, and, and it's not like these are hard and fast dates, right? They're going to be slightly different at different latitudes. So when they transition from early season to pre-rut, is it going to be a day or two different in Arizona than it is in Alberta? Um, but for me, and I always say if you're hunting in August, like I had a Utah archery tag that started in August, that was early season. And then the first probably anywhere from 7th to 10th to October 5th, somewhere in there, 5th to 10th, to me that's peak rut. And then... After October 15th to November 1st, I call that post rut. And post rut's the hardest time of the entire elk calendar to kill an elk. That's why all the states have their rifle seasons in late October. 
because the vulnerability of elk is very low. So you have that post rut period from October 10th, 15th, something like that to November 1st. And then anything November, December, January, I call late season. So <clears throat> approaching it that way, we start with our human calendar. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be in Montana in November. That's what I call late season. So I, I start with our human calendar and roll that up to what calendar period for elk is that. And then the four needs change with every period. So at the beginning in early season, it's food. Food is the absolute primary need. You go and look at, in August, one of the great places to go and look is Ted Turner on the Flying D Ranch out here. You can drive all the way through it up to uh, Spanish Peaks. You go there in August and those bulls are just, even after they've rubbed, they're just feeding, 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 feeding. They're in their own groups. There are no cows nearby. They are selecting for whatever food the bulls want at that time of year. Then comes late August, early September. They are still somewhat on a feed pattern, but breeding starts climbing the ladder of priority. So, and it's not like they all show up at the water hole and say, hey boys, tomorrow is September 8th. I guess we better turn the page in it's peak rut because we've all had a situation where on September 2nd, there's some cow that's in cycle and it's just got everybody fired up. So it, it, I always want people to know it's not hard and fast, um, but when you get to the pre-rut, breeding goes from the lowest priority right up there with food and water. And it's going to exceed the need of food and water as you get to the peak rut. And then you've got three, four weeks of the peak rut where it's just breeding. That, that's it, that's all, I don't worry about anything else. And well, <clears throat> one of the things that often happens because we talk a lot about, and let me get back to that point, um, walking past elk, remind me to get back to the walking past elk point. So I'll continue this calendar. So then you get into October and you're into the post rut. Well, they, they've just wore themselves down from the rut. There's a lot more activity in the woods because rifle seasons are starting. They know something's up. They're still solo for the most part. They're not yet in their bachelor groups and they are going for sanctuary. So breeding becomes very, very low. Other than the raghorns and the three and a half year olds, you'll still see them at the beginning of the post rut with some cows, but you're really hunting a sanctuary type survival mode bull at that point, at least highly pressured public land bulls. And then when you get into the late season, it's very similar to the post rut, other than they're in bachelor groups. The weather now forces them, usually it's colder, there's more snow, the weather forces them to be out longer. It forces them down in their elevations a little more. They have to select for better food options, even though they're still not gonna cover a lot of ground. If they could get all the food they needed in a space the size of this room, they would do that until hunting season's over. And then in those periods, you look at post rut. So in most instances, not, not all places, any place there's mountains or alpine environments, you're gonna have mostly summer range up higher and winter range down lower and everything in between is a transition range. Well, as quick as post rut comes, you're gonna see those bulls dropping off the summer range and they're gonna be up here in the higher part of the transition range. And the cows are just gonna blow right down to the lower state land is leased by parks and wildlife. Whereas in Montana, that's the only Western state I know that's that way. Um, there's a lot of leftover tags in Eastern Wyoming. Um, are we recording? <laughs> So I'm already, I already get blamed for making Wyoming animal hunting too popular if people can't draw the tag they used to draw. Part of that is antelope numbers have been creeping down and down and down. So there's far fewer tags than there used to be. So even if everything stayed static, it'd be harder to draw. But there is a program Wyoming has on their website called PLPW, Private Lands, Public Wildlife. It's an access program. The number of animals that we shoot on those walk-in properties, it's crazy. 
and a lot of it's checkerboard. You know, the other, Wyoming gives you a real good heads up. In their regulations, their application uh, booklet, they put a little asterisk by any unit that has difficult access. Every animal hunt you've ever seen us do is in one of those units that have difficult access. And if ever Onyx goes out of business, I'm done applying in Wyoming. I, I, I have to have it for the places we apply. And people will say, well, how do you draw so many things? Well, I don't want to apply in the unit that's 100% public land because I know the draw odds are going to be really, really low. I'll take my chances. And with antelope in the rut, and most of these archery seasons are in the rut, and even in Wyoming, uh, the rifle seasons, a lot of them are in the rut. These antelope are sure, buzzing around. You know, oh, if you rode like me, there was this game called Pong. Hey, that's what they look like. They look like the Pong screen running around there. Um, and, and just as an example, in 2014, uh, I had two days to go down there, and it's a unit that has the little asterisk by it. And I saw this really big buck. I was driving down the interstate, actually. Oh, man, went up to the next approach. I'm like, oh, darn, it's all private out there. Well, I'm going to take this oil and gas road and go to, drive through to where this other public was. And on my way there, there's some guys who had stopped, and they're looking at this buck. I told my camera guy, I'm like, Hey, they're filming us. They're going to kill this thing. see it. And they jump in their truck and they take off. Well, the rut's on. I go to the next little piece of BLM and I wait there. And sure enough, these things start chasing each other. And he ends up over on the BLM. Boom. Shoot him. 86-inch buck. It's like, who walks away from an 86-inch buck? Uh, but... In Wyoming, that opportunity exists, especially if you're archery hunting. Um, there's a lot of places to go here and have nearly the hunting pressure. So I'd say Wyoming is probably your best bet for something like that. Wyoming, uh, Montana, we have a, a pretty easy to draw archery prong hunt tag also. Uh, we've had so many bad winters in the last 15 years that our prong hunt numbers are nowhere what they were 15 years ago. But there's still opportunity. When it comes to that charter board access that you're talking about, I know you, you talk sometimes in your podcast about border crossing yep. and stuff. Is, is every state kind of treat that differently, or is it pretty much treated the same? Uh, I hate it when this question comes Sorry. up. Sorry. <laughs> no. um, so, Wyoming, Albany County had a corner crossing case and it got thrown out. So, a lot of, in, in Wyoming, a lot of the uh, game wardens are of the opinion, well, we're not going to prosecute or cite somebody for corner crossing because the judge is going to throw it out. That doesn't mean the county sheriff feels the same way. So it's it's all over the map. I, I tell people, don't do it unless you're willing to take a huge risk. So I don't do it. Is there like uh, I see on the videos you're like hunting mule deer, elk, and Animals and body of other species. Are you doing anything else besides, you know, everybody's got on it, so everybody's got go hunt nowadays. Are you doing anything else to find like those hidden gem units, whether it be deer, elk, antelope, or, you know, is there something yeah. that you do to separate yourselves? Yeah, and I've told my employees if they tell anyone what I do, I'll fire them and kill them. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I, this one, I, I'm, I don't share some of these. Um, what's that? <laughs> uh, so, a little history. I first started doing this multi-state application process in 1995. So, it's a 24 years ago. Um, and at the time, it was pretty easy to draw a tag. There weren't a lot of people. And mule deer numbers across the West were much higher, so it was easier to draw mule deer tags. Antelope numbers were higher, it was much easier. Elk have actually increased, so. But, yeah, there's things I do that, uh, I mean, one of them there, I look for units that people don't want to mess with the access issues. I said that's probably the very first sorting criteria that, that we use. 
how, how do we get 12 or 14 tags in a season between me and our crew? Well, we know we're not going to drive the Arizona Strip and, you know, whatever, the Missouri Brakes rifle tag and all the glory tags, we know we're not going to get those. So we have to do it in a different way. So we do that. Um, if you analyze trends of what, so Go Hunt has the best historical draw odds out there. And the flip side of that is they're not predictive. There's nothing that is predictive that's available. So a lot of that is just gut and how you think, what, how are people gonna respond to certain things? I subscribe to every service that does recommendations on units, uh, all the magazines, all the whatever. And when I get those, it's like, cross that one off, cross that one off, cross that one off. Because two reasons. One, a lot of people don't have time to, to invest hours and hours a week like I do in application season. So they're just going to say, yeah, that sounds good. If I draw, I'm supposed to shoot a 350-inch bull. Yeah, I'll do that. So those units that are recommended are good units, but they just get hammered. There's some crazy hammered. So I avoid all those. So that, that's part of my strategy. And I, people say, well, wouldn't you like one of those things? Yeah, I would, but I don't want to wait. I mean, when you're 55, you don't want to wait 20 years for a tag. You want to tag tomorrow. So uh, I, I do that as, as part of my approach. There's things that, there's behaviors that hunters have that you can, to some degree, not complete certainty, predict where trends are gonna go the following year. If someone shoots a really big buck in unit, whatever, it's like, cross that off your list because it's gonna be on every website, every Facebook page, you know what? I'm, I'm not even, not even close to being on my radar screen. Um, if you, gosh, I, I can't say that. <laughs> I'm trying to think how I can say this. So there is a state that has a booming elk population in the unit that they're about ready to open that up to non-residents next year. God, I can't believe I'm saying that. I was on the phone with the biologist yesterday talking about it. So the odds are the non-resident demand for that unit is going to be pretty low next year. But knowing what bulls live there, good luck drawing it in 2021. 20, so there's things like that that I try to do. And then there's a bunch more too, but I just, I'm sorry, I, I can't. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And I mean, my crew, well, the guys that go hunt, uh, Chris and Lorenzo and Brady and those guys, they they tell me that they can see how much time someone's logged in on their account. Like, Do you get any work done? You're not logged in like 50, 60 hours a week. <laughs> part of it is me logged in, but part of it is also we're filming clips, and so the production crew is logged into my account getting screen captures. But I spend a ridiculous amount of time researching draw offs and, and stuff. Um, things where there's a change from limited entry to, un or unlimited to limited entry. So, I can never draw a tag in Idaho, so I'm gonna share this. Because it seems like it doesn't matter. But Idaho had a lot of tags that used to be unlimited for mule deer. In the last five years, they went to limited. They're still not as high demand as the Franklin Hills and the Hawaii tags. They're getting to be harder to draw, but the quality of the animals that my friends are shooting there, really, really good. So how long that will continue to be the case? I, I don't know, but there, so nothing stays static out there on the landscape, both in terms of the regulations, in terms of the populations, whatever. Uh, and I try to stay on top of those and alter my application strategy. Right now, if you could log into my Google account and check my Google Docs, I have my 2020 and my 2021 applications already online based on just 
things that I don't want to forget about them. If I hear a little tidbit, it's like, I gotta get that in the spreadsheet. No, forget it. So I, I don't know if that helps. I, oh, well, and don't be like Randy. You know, last two years, I drew, I drew some really good tags and I got a little full of myself. So this year, 2019, I'm like, oh, I can draw that tag. Usually I don't aim for uh, the tier or strata of tags I applied for this year. And I appreciate that. I got an empty sack. I'm, I'm gonna be hunting a lot over the counter gym tag this year. I got a little greedy. I'm, I thought it was knowledge and, and just, I'm smarter than everyone else. Really, a lot of it's luck. <laughs> I wasn't that lucky this year. So. But, uh, you know, my thoughts on tag application. Sure. Uh, November bull tags, they're basically in glassing, south facing slopes, and it's a pretty much spot on stock. And, and then would your tactics be the same in Nevada as there would in for that? They would, the tactics would be the same in all states in November. It is a glassing game. It, people will email me and say, I can't believe you spent three days on the same rock. Well, if you would have seen what I saw while scouting in there, you would have sat on that same rock for three days also. Um, but no, I'm not glassing. I'm seldom glassing south-facing slope. Very seldom am I glassing south-facing slopes. Normally, I'm trying to position myself, and I'll have a different glassing spot in the morning, a different glassing spot in the afternoon. Um, I like to be able to, in the morning, <coughs> I got to orient myself here. So this is north. Um, if I had a perfect layout, there'd be a basin that folds out from the north and runs south, and I'd get up somewhere where I could glass into that basin, because when the sun comes up from the east, I know that this west stuff over here is going to light up first. And if I'm going to see activity right at daylight, I'm probably going to see it on that slope. And then it allowed me to work my glass for a lot longer period of time. And eventually I'm starting to get over here where it stays shaded longer because those animals will stay out later. And usually I put them, we, we let them go to bed. We try to watch them go to their bed. We sell them in an, uh, in an elk hunt in November. We'll try to go after elk that are on their feet. We try to let them go to bed, and we take however much time we can to get over there. And you think, as many years as I've hunted elk, I wouldn't let the wind screw me up, but I still get excited and do something wrong. Yeah, it's wrong, but it'll be good when we get over there 100 yards, and I cross that 100 yards of bad wind, and boom, off they go. So sometimes we make these ridiculous big routes to get above them. And sometimes they don't come out before shooting light. But one of the things we do, the benefit of doing that is we know they're there. In a late season period, they're not moving unless they get pushed by another hunter. But we will sit there till dark and then we'll come out. We will take the easiest route and mark it on our on X on the way out. So the next morning we can come in there well before daylight and we will be right there waiting for them again because in this late season november period they're not moving a lot other than for hunting pressure and so if you see them in the morning a lot of times you can get in on them in the afternoon sometimes we'll see them in the afternoon and it's like mm, we'll never get there in time we'll get a little closer try to and maybe it gets dark on us we put a mark on where we know the bull was and then we mark our path out of there so that we come in before daylight radio so we'll be going in on a stock and someone's like stop stop one of the camera guys they have complete control the camera guys have complete control on everything when we're going in on a stock so they will stop you and say your microphone is, is rubbing on one of your layers so there's a bull up there you gotta fix that. So you stop for 30 minutes while they're doing sound checks and stuff. Uh, and then you go back on your way. And then you get there, and I've had camera guys say, Well, we can't come in from that way because we'll be filming right into the light. Well, if we come in with the light at our back, the wind's at our back, well, that's what we're gonna have to do. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, so 
there, there's so many complications in what we do that I would never impose. The only people I'll impose on are longtime friends and, and family members. And, and when we have sweepstakes winners, I just feel terrible for them. I'm like, this is not going to be what they thought it was going to be. They're going to get so mad. I'm so frustrated. And then the other thing, he, he's over here. He doesn't have headset on, but... I forget, I'll, I'll get mad, I'll forget the camera guys have me mic'd and they've got the headset, headphones in the jack and they can hear everything. I'm like, these effing camera guys. <laughs> Somebody's walking home tonight and they'll be like, I can hear you. <laughs> oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, but the filming part adds a lot for us. We, uh, uh, we're really big about public land film permits. They're a big pain in the butt. Uh, they're complicated, they're expensive. And as an example, we had a hunt in Wyoming where the BLM says, you gotta tell us what part of the unit you're hunting because if I want the whole unit, it costs more. Is what they were telling me. Come to find out they don't have to do it that way. But back when I was young and naive. Uh, so we, I'm like, all right, this is the area I want permitted for. Well, there's a smaller mountain range over there that they go to the elk head over there if it's really bad weather. I'm like, oh, we're here in early part of November. The weather's not going to be that bad. Well, the weather got that bad. And all the elk are over there. I'm not permitted for it. Even though my, my hunting tag is good for that mountain range, my film permit isn't. That's really frustrating. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see him all over there. Nothing good about it. <laughs> so... So on your bill for minutes, do, you, do they just make up the prices when you call them up based on who you are? Or is there a set, is there a set menu? How does that whole price what, when, to get a film permit? To get a film permit? Yeah. Um, you have to call the state or fed, uh, federal agency. Mostly it's the BLM enforcers. Uh, and you tell them, you know, I got to talk to the permit officer. And then you, I've done so many of them. In most instances, I've done more film permits than that person has. And I almost have it filled out. I have the map. I got to give them a map where we're hunting, where we're parking, where we're camping. So what have people started to do? I get notices that, hey, so-and-so filed a freedom of information request on your film permit. Oh. Yeah, it's happening a lot. And so if you really, if anyone wants to know where I hunt and where we camp and where that episode was, just call the agency and ask for my film permit and it'll be laid out right there. <laughs> but I mean, when it comes to pricing, I mean, it's like a good old boy club, like you can be one price for one guy and another price for another guy. It's, it's a daily rate. There's an application fee and then there's a daily rate. It's pretty standardized. Right. Okay. Yeah. So... There's that, and then you know you, you've got certain rules and requirements you got to follow. Um, there's, uh, we did a bear hunt. I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this. Anyhow, it's raining like crazy, and your my film permit says you have to build your fire below the high tide line. Well, I'm not gonna stand out in three days of torrential rain and try to dry my clothes out of fire. Where, because there's no there's no canopy below the high tide line, so I go and build this little fire about from here to that wall back into the trees. Man, did I get a tongue lashing when he went and inspected our site and found a little fire ring back there, twenty yards off the high tide line. And then he sent me booklets and no, oh, remember you you know you got one strike. And, I mean he's a good guy, but I think it's just his job. That's what he's got to do. So yeah, it's if people knew what we deal with the film permits, they'd know why most people just say, screw it, I'll ask for permission or forgiveness instead of permission. But so, so everybody that's no longer should see right they have that role because you're only if you're in a commercial enterprise. So if if you're on if you have a YouTube channel that you've monetized, if you're doing it for say you're reselling your work, uh you know, we're on Amazon, YouTube, if you're on the TV networks, if it's a commercial activity. So some companies go out and they film on public lands for their, you know, they'll do a 30 second commercial and they'll do promo stuff. 
technically they're both Title VII compliant. Compliance is really low. <laughs> I, I spend between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year on my film permits. Yeah. Is there any basis for them to deny you a permit? Have you ever been denied? Yeah. No, it's completely at their discretion. And so one of the good parts about being involved in politics like I am, call someone in DC, you know so-and-so won't give me a film permit? What? And then you get an email. I have been told I'm supposed to give you a film permit. <laughs> I hate to do that because you know the next time they're going to figure out some other way to submarine me. Uh, the hard part is wilderness area is very fickle. So in region one of the Forest Service, which is Montana, Northern Idaho, uh, I think it might be part of, part of Wyoming, they have a default position, no film permits in a wilderness area. So I had a friend draw the goat tag over here in the Zorky Bear Troops. We couldn't sell it. I, I wanted to. I had a friend draw a sheep tag in Wyoming in the, how do you say it, Washakie Wilderness or whatever that is. Couldn't get a film permit to film it. Um, it also affects our application strategy. I, I don't apply in wilderness areas in Region 1 Forest Service. Nevada, whatever region they're in out of Ogden, they've let me film in the East Humboldt Wilderness. They've let me film in the Ruby Wilderness. They're like... Knock yourself out. New Mexico, whatever your, uh, region of the Forest Service that is, there's a guy on the Lincoln National Forest who loves our content. I send him my permit. He's like, yeah, come on down. I just redid the trail through the wilderness area. It's like, there, there's no consistency to it. It's kind of frustrating. But, so if you ask for a film permit, the odds are you won't see us on any wilderness areas. And for me, it's frustrating because Maroon Bells in Colorado. I had a deer tag in the Maroon Bells. Hey, I want to go filming there. No, it's wilderness area. You can't. Well, there you outside. The Bells is not that. It's, it's okay, but it's not like being up on Mount Sopris and all that stuff. All right, so we hunt the periphery down there, and I shoot an okay buck. But it was tough on Next year, I turn on the TV. I'm like, that's Mount Silvers. <laughs> How did those people get a film permit? They did, man. Be my guess. I didn't ask them. But it's like, Dang, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> no. But it's just part of what we deal with. So uh, that's just a, a discussion of don't film your hunts. Don't have fun. Don't don't do what we do. It's. I mean, the number of animals we have let slip through our fingers because of filming is crazy. If any of you watch our doll sheep hunt on YouTube last year, it was a day by day in Alaska. The first day, there were these eight rams at 180 yards right down below us. Yeah. Don't film a doll sheep hunt. Off they go, and not a shot was fired. Now, if we played that full piece, <laughs> we'd have an adult rating on it. You know, 